listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder that Words on Film is the show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com and WBCA, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them I say thank you. Or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. Just another note that the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working on the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, let's get into my first segment, which is what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Some of them are hits already. Some of them are not looking promising, but I will tell you them accordingly. So for the first time in five weeks, Black Panther is not number one at the box office. It was upstaged by Pacific Rim Uprising, which of course is the sequel to the 2013 film directed by Guillermo del Toro called Pacific Rim. Now this is not one of the five movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show, but it is indeed number one. And for those of you who don't know, I do have a particular rule with sequels in that I don't see sequels unless I've seen the original first. I have made a few exceptions, like with Magic Mike XXL, just to name one sequel off the top of my head, but I haven't seen Pacific Rim Uprising because I haven't actually seen the original Pacific Rim. Hopefully nobody gets mad at me about that. But in any event, even though I didn't see it, plenty of other people did. This weekend it grossed $28.1 million at the U.S. box office and a staggering $150.5 million worldwide against a budget of $150 million. So here in the States, it still has a ways to go to recoup its budget, but already in just one weekend, Pacific Rim Uprising is a tentative hit. Black Panther is not number one, as I said, but it's number two, and it's still hanging in there, having made $17.1 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $200 million so far, Black Panther has made in the United States a staggering $631.4 million dollars, And around the world, it has made $1.239 billion. So it's doing incredibly well for itself. And it goes without saying that it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. I Can Only Imagine debuted last weekend at number three. This weekend, it is also number three, having grossed $13.6 million. Against a relatively small budget of $7 million, I Can Only Imagine has so far grossed $38.1 million worldwide. Around the world, I don't have the numbers for you there, but here in the States, it is already a certified hit. Sherlock Gnomes is the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, but is number four at the box office this weekend, having grossed a decent $10.6 million, and that's against a budget of $59 million. Around the world, it's done a little bit better, having grossed $15.2 million, but still, Sherlock Gnomes, which is a sequel to Gnomeo and Juliet, I'm not sure how many other literary classics they can make into bad gnome puns, but I, I wouldn't stop this studio from trying but either way Sherlock Gnomes is not a hit yet here in the states or around the world it's not looking particularly good for this film so far Tomb Tomb Raider took a big drop last weekend it was number two this weekend it's number five which is actually too bad because for as far as video game movies go I actually thought Tomb Raider was pretty good but this weekend it grossed a decent 10.1 million dollars against a budget of 90 to 106 million dollars somewhere in that range tomb raider is so far in the united states grossed 41.4 million dollars and around the world it has grossed 211.7 million dollars so there's yeah a huge difference between how much it's grossing in the states and how much it's grossing worldwide i'm not sure if it's because lara croft is a well-known international video game character or because of alicia vikander's International appeal could be a combination of both, but either way, Tomb Raider is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit by quite a bit. A Wrinkle in Time is a movie that in its three weeks in release is struggling. This weekend it grossed $8.2 million. 
against a budget of $100 million. A Wrinkle in Time has so far grossed $74.1 million here in the States and $88 million around the world, which means it is not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. It may eke its way to being a tentative hit here in the States and maybe even around the world too, but right now it's not either of those things. Love, Simon is a movie that is still kind of under the radar here, but it's getting a lot of underground buzz. It is number seven this week, dropping from number five last week, having grossed $7.6 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $17 million, Love, Simon has so far grossed $23.5 million here in the States. I don't have any information for how this movie is doing worldwide, but here in the States, it's a tentative hit. Paul, Apostle of Christ, is another religious movie, like I can only imagine. That was number eight at the box office this weekend and may go up, especially given that next weekend is Easter weekend, but we'll have to see. But Paul, Apostle of Christ, Christ made $5.2 million this past weekend against a budget of $5 million, and that's just in the States. Very much like Love, Simon, I don't have the international numbers for you here, but Paul, Apostle of Christ in the United States is a tentative hit. Game Night is number nine at the box office this weekend, sliding from number six last week, having grossed $4.1 million here in the States this past weekend. Against a budget of $37 million, it's done pretty well for itself, having grossed $60.8 million here in the States and $94.8 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, very close to being a certified hit, but around the world it's already there at certified status. And finally, number 10 of the box office is Midnight Sun, which grossed $4 million this weekend and is the fourth highest grossing debut movie of the week. I don't have the budget for you for this movie, but I can tell you that it grossed $6.2 million worldwide so far. It could have cost $5 million to make. It could have cost $20 million to make. But I cannot tell you, based on the fact that I don't have the budget information for this movie, that I cannot tell you if it is a tentative hit or a certified hit, or none of the above. But what I can tell you is it's off to a decent start, but opening at number 10, it's unlikely that we're going to be seeing this film next week, and I don't think we're going to be seeing Game Night next week in the top 10 either. Open road, here comes the Hefley family. You've packed the smartphones, headphones, tablets, water snacks, coolers, sunscreen, bikes, skateboards, games, videos, sunglasses. There's no room for people in here. Just don't wimp out on the most important thing. Deep, Deep fried, fried butter, butter on, on a stick. stick. No, seatbelts. Whether it's a long haul or short trip. It's a win-win situation. Never give up until they buckle up. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is I Can Only Imagine. Now, I Can Only Imagine is not exactly a new film. I, I suppose it's new to many of you, but for me, if a movie's been out for a week, it's officially old. I guess that's one of the things about being a film critic. But I Can Only Imagine is a film I missed its opening weekend, but I got to catch it this weekend. And it is a Christian film. It's actually based on the story behind the song of the same name, I Can Only Imagine, which was released as a single in 2001 and became the most played Christian radio single ever. And it's by a band by the name of Mercy Me, no relation to the Marvin Gaye song. But the movie is actually tells the story of Bart Millard, who is the lead singer of Mercy Me, who wrote the song about his relationship with his father, his abusive father, who in this movie is played by... Dennis Quaid. Uh, somewhat miscast, but I'll get to that a little bit later. So, actually, Bart Millard wrote this song originally for Amy Grant, who actually plays herself in this movie. But I guess m maybe there was a little bit of artistic liberty in, in this sense, but Amy Grant in this film decides to have Bart Millard sing the song at her concert 
right at the very last minute. Again, I'm not sure how much of that is actually true. And to be honest with you, I actually did not know the song I can only imagine existed until I saw this movie. I, I don't want to say that I just absolutely ignore Christian music out there, but yeah, Christian radio singles, I don't listen to Christian radio, so let me just get that out of the way. And there actually are some parts in this movie where the single is being distributed to various radio stations all over the country, and there are some radio stations that say, hey, we're not a Christian radio station, far from it, but this song is great. But when you actually listen to the song, he's talking about walking in God's light and dancing in front of Jesus. I'm thinking, you know, there are no secular radio stations that could have played this song. Having said that, the movie is decent. I, I think it's actually decently acted. And the, the actor who plays Bart Millard is somebody named J. Michael Finley, who is known for being a Broadway actor and singer. And he does sing very well. The problem with this movie is I think it paints over a lot of the ugly parts and almost inserts tropes into this film, which otherwise could have been a compelling story. And I did like and appreciate the fact that it was about forgiveness, especially being magnanimous towards someone you don't have the instinct to forgive. In other, in other words, Bart Miller's father in this movie is abusive and... He, he probably, in fact, he most certainly was in real life. What didn't really make sense to me were some of the events that led up to Bart Millard's growing up. For instance, you are introduced to Bart Millard as a kid sometime in the late 80s, and he's living with his mother and father, and he has a very cantankerous relationship with his father, and it's very easy to see why, but, of course... He gets along well with his mother, but then his mother sends him away to Christian camp, and when he comes back home, he finds that his mother has not only divorced his dad, but moved away from the family and left him behind to be raised by his abusive father. And the movie paints the mother in a very sympathetic light, but you begin to think to yourself, wait a second. If the mother loves the son as much as the character in this movie wants me to think she loves him, then why did she move away without even telling the boy? Not much less having him live with a mentally unstable, not insane, but definitely mentally unstable father. So that didn't make sense to me. And of course, it would make sense that this guy would be raised by his abusive father, but something tells me that there were some ugly parts that this movie painted over. But again, if you're looking for a movie that is inspiring and teaches you about forgiveness, then I can only imagine does hit the right notes. As I said, because it's a movie about a Christian song, the movie has a very dominant Christian theme. But what I think that makes this movie rise above many other Christian drama films that are coming out and will come out. As a matter of fact, the third God's Not Dead movie is coming out this coming weekend. What makes I Can Only Imagine better than those movies is it actually deals with the complexities of Christianity and of forgiving somebody for their past discretions, especially if those discretions are aimed towards you and certainly hurt you in some way. I mean, I, th I think that's a very important message. But then the movie gets into Bart Millard, played by J. Michael Finley, struggling on the road with his band Mercy Me. And actually, I thought that Trace Atkins plays the manager of this band. And Trace Atkins is somewhat limited in his acting ability, but I think he does well in this movie. And he also has some funny parts. And Trace Atkins from what... Again, I'm not a country music fan at all, but I've seen Trace Atkins on two seasons of the, of the Celebrity Apprentice, and I've actually gained a lot of respect for Trace Atkins after seeing him on that show, unlike another particular person who hosted that show. But, of course, n no politics in, in this <laughs> review of mine. But there was one part, particularly when... Trace Atkins' character, the band's manager, is shopping Mercy Me around to various Christian labels. 
And Bart Miller barges in on the meeting between these labels, and he says, come on, br- bring it on. Let me know what you think. I- I've got a... I got skin as thick as a rhino, and that is actually a quote from the movie. And the the, the executive said, I- I'm sorry, we, we can't uh, shop this band around. I-, I don't think we'd be able to sell. And then he starts to break down. He goes, but we're good, and you're wrong. And I'm thinking, well, so much for that thick skin you, you said you had, as thick as a rhino. So... The problem with this scene was not the rejection part. I mean, bands get rejected by labels all the time. Even the Beatles got rejected by certain labels before breaking out on their own. But the the problem here is you don't really know the sound of the band. You're given snippets, but you're not given a, a, a decent picture of the band. But as I said, I can only imagine certainly is better than I thought it would be and far less preachy than I imagined it would be. So it gets my rating of a checkout. Certainly not a great movie, but worth recommending in in some parts. The Western Scrub Jay. I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, He had spotted the elusive Black Swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine-year-old boy. He had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time. Heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing is Midnight Sun, which at first glance might seem like a Nicholas Sparks movie or a movie based on a Nicholas Sparks book. Interestingly enough, it is actually somewhat of an original motion picture. It is based on a previous medium, but it's actually based on a movie, not a book. It's based on a movie of the same name, written by Kenji Bondo, because it was a Japanese film, and adapted to the U.S. by Eric Kirsten, and directed by Scott Spear. It stars Bella Thorne and Patrick Schwarzenegger, and guess who Patrick Schwarzenegger's father is? Just take a wild guess as to who his father is. So, the movie is about a 17-year-old girl who suffers from a condition that prevents her from being out in the sunlight. The specific condition is called uh, Xeroderma pigmentosum, or XP for short. And what XP does to those who are inflicted by it, and it's, it's a pretty rare disease, thankfully, is that anybody who is exposed to even the slightest bit of sunlight gets skin cancer much more easily. And there's also, I'm not a doctor, so I can't exactly tell you exactly what happens to the brain, but but something fatal happens. So Katie Price, who's played in this movie by Bella Thorne, has been sheltered in her in her home since early childhood. Again, it's not one of those fairy tale complexes where her father just sh- shields her from the outside world. She actually does need to be inside throughout a majority of the of the day uh, until the the sun fades. And her father in this movie is named Jack, and and he's played by Rob Riggle. And I got to tell you, man, 
I've always liked Rob Riggle ever since I saw him on Saturday Night Live. He's been in a couple of dramas, which, you know, have been somewhat forgettable. But just about every comedy I've seen him in since his days on SNL, I've really liked him in. Especially, he was probably one of the better parts of Dumb and Dumber 2. Even people who hated that movie, and I'm not one of them. I actually thought it was pretty funny. But people who hated that movie still liked Rob Riggle in in that movie. And in this movie, he does a pretty good job playing a a fleshed-out character. Again, he's not this overprotective jerk of a father like the the movie may have been tempted to make him instead i i think he's actually a, a really cool character so katie is homeschooled as it's it's probably necessary that she needs to be she does have a friend by the name of morgan who, who in this movie is played um as 17 years old by quinn shepherd but she notices a boy by the name of charlie who goes by her window every day on his way to school and swimming practice. Charlie, as a 17-year-old, who's actually 24 in real life, is again played by Patrick Schwarzenegger. And this is not Patrick Schwarzenegger's first role in a movie, but it is probably his biggest starring role or co-starring role to date. And I've seen Bella Thorne in a number of other films. Some of the films have been good, some have been bad, but I think this is probably her best performance to date. And what I liked about Bella Thorne's performance in this movie is she was relatable, but she also could play somebody who lacked confidence, especially when she meets Charlie for the first time. I was absolutely convinced that Bella Thorne, even though she is very pretty, certainly lacked confidence in this role and when she played nervous and when she played awkward i absolutely believed her so it's a testament to bella thorne and how how far she's come as an actress and going beyond the usual teen movies she's done like for instance the duff and a a few others there was one i saw last year on netflix which was a teen ripoff of fatal attraction uh, that was a pretty bad movie, but Bella Thorne wasn't bad in it. It wasn't, it wasn't her fault that the movie was bad. And I think, surprisingly, this movie plays to many of her, her strengths as an actress. And I did not expect this for a movie that's billed as a romantic drama. But that is pretty much exactly what it is. Plus, I think that Bella Thorne and Patrick Schwarzenegger have amazing chemistry in this movie together. For... Patrick Schwarzenegger, I think probably it would have been best for him to maybe have changed his last name or shortened it to Schwartz because the the only downside to that is when you know what his name is in real life, you're watching the film and you're realizing what a, a striking resemblance he has to his father. And he certainly does have that resemblance, maybe without the muscles. Sorry, Patrick. But... Again, once you get past that and you actually see him and Bella Thorne's character have a, a relationship that, that blossoms, you are totally taken by this relationship. I went into this movie expecting this to be another Nicholas Sparks film or a, a story like Nicholas Sparks. And the, the movie certainly has a predictable sequence of events that goes with it but the ending actually really surprised me when the the two of them Bella Thorne and Patrick Schwarzenegger's characters decide what to do about XP and XP is a treatment that is unfortunately not curable but once you get into that you you get to appreciate this film for what it was plus I also didn't expect especially given that it's a former Disney Channel star Bella Thorne that I would really enjoy the music that, that's in this film. And I assume that Bella Thorne s- sings her own songs in this movie because I, I know that in addition to acting, given that she's coming out of the Disney Channel machine, she can also sing. In terms of dancing, I don't know, but she can certainly act, she can certainly sing. And I really liked some of the song in this movie. There's, there's one particular scene where Bella Thorne and Patrick Schwarzenegger's characters go to Seattle for a concert, but then he convinces her to just play her music on the street, and she attracts a crowd. And the song she plays is actually really 
nice. I, I, I enjoyed it. So Midnight Sun is not my kind of movie. Romantic dramas are not my thing. And even after I get married, they probably won't be my thing. But I really liked Midnight Sun. I liked the four main actors in this film. Bella Thorne and Rob Riggle probably turned in their best career performances to date. And I would love to see what Bella Thorne comes out with next. Midnight Sun is actually, and I do say the word actually, a knockout. It's not a movie I expected to like. Fortunately, it's not based on anything by Nicholas Sparks. It's not entirely predictable. It has some moments of predictability, but overall, the ending will surprise you. Did you just look down at your phone? You did it again, didn't you? You know, you're flying down the road in a three-ton hunk of steel. And a text takes your eyes off the road for an average of five seconds. At 55 miles per hour, that's long enough to travel the length of a football field and cause some serious damage. Turn it off. Trust me, whatever it is, you'll live. Learn more at StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Unsane, the latest from director Steven Soderbergh, which stars mostly not quite as well-known actors. I don't want to say unknown actors, but the main actress in this movie is named Claire Foy, and she is a British actress who plays american in this film and i've seen a number of other films she's in such as the woman in the van or i should say the lady in the van and also she was in season of the witch and breathe and vampire academy but she's not a, an actress who has had a starring role until unsane and here in this movie, she plays a young woman uh, in her early 20s, presumably, who is involuntarily committed to a mental institution where she is confronted by her greatest fear. And is her fear real or a product of her delusion? And what's interesting about the movie Unsane is not just the premise of a woman who is who, go, who goes to an institution at first to talk to somebody, but then finds herself involuntarily committed to a mental institution out of alleged fears of killing herself when you can actually tell from the way she conducts herself that she's not actually clinically unstable and certainly not suicidal it turns out when you're watching the film that that it's revealed that she is actually in hiding from a man who was stalking her and the incident got so bad that she moved from her native Boston to Pennsylvania, presumably Philadelphia. And Claire Foy gives a great performance in this film, but the movie really gets going when not only is she committed, but she finds that one of the people who is working in the mental hospital happens to be the man who was stalking her who in this movie is played by Joshua Leonard. And Joshua Leonard is an actor who's gotten a lot of experience, but he's probably best known for playing a version of himself in The Blair Witch Project. And I've seen Joshua Leonard in a number of films and TV shows to date. And here in this movie, I didn't expect, especially after seeing him in The Blair Witch Project, that he'd be scary in this movie, but he certainly has his scary moments, especially when the camera zooms in on his bearded face. And you're wondering, man, why why is this guy so obsessed with this woman? I mean, yes, she's pretty, but man, it's it's just a mystery with a number of people who stalk or become obsessed with certain people. Uh, you you just kind of wonder when is it going to end this obsession and when do they let it go? But 
In any event, that's the premise of the movie. It certainly is very chilling. And Steven Soderbergh does something interesting here in that he films the movie with an iPhone or a, a, a smartphone rather than the, the usual cameras. And it's, it certainly gives the movie a chilling feel. And according to a, a report, this, bud, this movie was only made for a budget of $1.2 million. It is Steven Soderbergh's first horror movie, and it was shot entirely with an iPhone camera. I'm not sure why Steven Soderbergh chose to film this just using an iPhone, but I was... I, I was still taken by this film, and I was certainly drawn into it. And I'm so glad this movie was not filmed or released as a found footage movie, because I think that years ago when I declared the found footage, footage movie to be dead, it took a little while, but I think now the found footage movie is kind of something to be laughed at. And while... It wasn't entirely necessary maybe to fil film this movie with an iPhone, or at least according to some other people. I actually thought it get, gave the movie a look, not only certainly a stripped-down look, but also it gave it somewhat of a paranoia, paranoid feel to it, as if somebody was watching this woman go about her daily activity. I thought that was a nice touch. It also reminded me, especially in the mental institution, of security cameras. Again, the security camera effect wasn't always apparent to me, but especially with scenes where it's showing the whole room from a corner, I immediately thought of security cameras. And I also thought of, it also added to the paranor, excuse me, let me choose my words carefully. The paranoia feeling that the, that the character played by Claire Foy probably had. And I thought that the acting in this movie was certainly top notch, especially by Claire Foy. Initially, when I saw posters of this film, I thought that Claire Foy's character was actually Emily Blunt. And there are certain moments where you look at Claire Foy and you think to yourself, wow, that kind of reminds me of a performance that Emily Blunt would make. But Claire Foy fortunately has, other than that, that poster shot, a, a, an original look to her that might remind you in flashes of Emily Blunt, but certainly she carries this movie with her own unique performance. And I also really like the supporting performance in this film by Jay Farrow, formerly of Saturday Night Live, probably one of the best impersonators that SNL has ever had, and also one of the many SNL cast members who seem to be unceremoniously dumped from SNL for reasons I don't know. And Jay Farrow doesn't do any particular impersonations here, but if you've seen him on Saturday Night Live, you've probably seen him do impersonations of President Obama, that, that is former President Obama, Will Smith, Jay-Z, and those impressions are spot on. He's probably one of the best impersonators on the show up there with Eddie Murphy, Dana Carvey, and Daryl Hammond. But here in this movie, I think he does actually a good job playing a guy who's not exactly comic relief, but comes to be an, an ally to reluctant Sawyer and, and is trying to, well, get Sawyer out of this situation. He's also a patient who doesn't seem to be mentally unstable, but is in a mental institution anyway. And there's a good explanation for why he might be. But Unseen is a movie that certainly had me riveted. I thought there were moments where the plot was a little contrived and some elements were added for dramatic effect. But the whole time, I was taken in. And certainly, Steven Soderbergh's unique way of shooting this movie with an iPhone camera added to that fear of suspense and paranoia, or feeling of suspense and paranoia. And Claire Foy did, has a career-making performance in this film, which I'm giving my rating of a knockout. It surprises me so much that this movie was in the top. This movie was not in the top ten, but I recommend it anyway. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake.
probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Boston Free Radio has no corporate agenda. We're independent media for the people. Your music, your voice, your station. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all. And yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering in the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Seven Days in Entebbe. This is a true crime thriller, and it's titled Seven Days in Entebbe here in the States. Around the world, it's titled Entebbe. And it is based on the true story of Operation Entebbe, which is a 1976 counter-terrorist hostage rescue organization. Here's the story. In 1976, I think it was June 28, 1976, two Palestinian and two German terrorists hijacked Air France Flight 139, which was en route from Tel Aviv, Israel, to Paris, France, via Athens, Greece. When the plane was grounded and was refueling before going to Athens, Greece, these two Palestinian and two German terrorists held the passengers and crew hostage and ultimately landed the plane in Entebbe, which is in Uganda, during the regime of Idi Amin, who in this movie is played not by Forrest Whitaker, although, man, I would have loved to have seen Forrest Whitaker reprise his role, but he's played by an actor named Nanso Anozi. And even though... Forrest Whitaker is a very tough act to follow. Nanzo Inozi here had the look of Idi Amin absolutely right here, but he just kind of makes an appearance and then disappears, which is really too bad because it's this is a movie that is a very compelling true story, but the movie drags it out. You could certainly see that the film is trying to be intriguing, and... At its root, it should be, but when it details every single moment or seemingly every single moment of the seven days that this plane is hijacked and these two Palestinian, two German, Palestinian, supporting, empathizing terrorists holding these people hostage, it's basically a lot of watching people sitting around and waiting for help to come. And... I I just watched this film and I thought to myself, while it might be a good companion piece to The Last King of Scotland, and the events that happened in in this film, not only are they true, but they also bookended the, the movie The Last King of Scotland and led to probably one of the best climaxes I've ever seen in any film, certainly let alone any film that's come out in the 21st century, I didn't sense any of that excitement in this film. And of course, films have to have room to breathe in addition to being exciting. But what I thought this movie did wrong was not only showing a lot of the dull parts over the exciting parts, but also getting the politics of the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians too embedded in the story and to western audiences particularly in u.s audiences we don't particularly get what the fighting is about between the israelis and the palestinians of course we understand some of the basic facts like israel being recognized internationally as a nation and people from palestine not having 
a particular land. We get that part. But that part right there is probably more than most Americans know. So Seven Days in Etobay has a story that maybe Western audiences don't care about so much, or at least a backstory, and also a hijacking that surprisingly isn't particularly thrilling. And the, the thing that's really too bad about this movie is there are some great actors in this film. You have Rosamund Pike and Daniel Bruhl as the two German terrorists, Bridget Kuhlman and Wilfred Bose. And, and some people have a problem with the fact that the, the terrorists were the protagonist in this film, which is a valid criticism. However, what I particularly didn't like was that they focused on the German white terrorists and not so much the Palestinian terrorists. Those terrorists were pushed right to the back. And while Rosamund Pike and Daniel Bruhl are certainly good actors, there were four people who made this mission happen, not two. And I didn't so much have a problem with them share, showing a sympathetic view of these Palestinian sympathizing terrorists. I just thought it, it brought a bit of imbalance to the story. And you also have another actor named Eddie Marson, who's, who plays Shimon Perez, who is part of the Israeli army that is brought in to bring down these terrorists and set the hostages free. And that part should have been thrilling, but after so much dragging in the film, it just didn't leave an impression on me. And I was watching the film thinking to myself, it is quite coincidental that this terrorist hijacking in Entebbe coincided with America's 200th anniversary. In other words, the, 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 the hostage siege ended on July 3rd, and the next day was, of course, July 4th, 1976. Again, that doesn't have anything to do with my criticism of the story. I just thought to myself... This would be better if we were given just more information, and maybe even more action. Just a combination of both those things. But Seven Days in Atabe had the makings of a potentially great film, and it certainly told a true event that undoubtedly probably had some draggy parts when it actually happened. But the movie has to take you in a certain way, and I didn't feel the same kind of thrill with Seven Days in Entebbe as I did with The Last King of Scotland, which, t which touches upon the, some of the events in this film, or even a, a similar film taking place around the same time, Argo. I just didn't feel that connection with the characters. I didn't feel any sense of thrill, even when the climax of this film happens, when the Israeli terrorists, or rather when the Israeli army takes down the terrorists. And there's also an epilogue that tells you about one of the soldiers in the Israeli army that rescues the hostages. One of those people is Benjamin Netanyahu, who, if you know your world history, goes on to become the prime minister of Israel, especially after Yitzhak Rabin, who's also depicted in this movie, gets killed. But Seven Days in Etobi... And Entebbe was not a particularly great movie, I think, as you could tell. I credit it for some of its good performances, but overall it was draggy, and it just didn't have me on the edge of my seat as it should have. And it gets my rating of a strikeout. It should have been a much better film and certainly a much more memorable film, but it wasn't. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. I love those real sick signs. Intensify and groove me. 
to see more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Thoroughbreds. This marks the directorial and screenwriting debut of Corey Finley, who actually has not even directed a short before this one. On IMDb, he's credited for writing a, a short called Sana, which just got completed, and that's dated as 2017. But in terms of any other movies... He's done short or feature length. He does not have a single other credit to his name, which I actually find pretty fascinating because Thoroughbreds is a very mature movie about high school kids. And it's certainly probably one of the most interesting movie about high school girls that I've seen. Ironically enough, not taking place in high school. The movie is about two upper-class teenage girls in suburban Connecticut who rekindle, who rekindle their unlikely friendship after years of growing apart. Together, they hatch a plan to solve both of their problems, no matter what the cost. So the movie is about a young high schooler named Amanda, who's played in this movie by Olivia Cook. And Olivia Cook might seem like a familiar name, particularly because she was in the terrible Ouija from 2014, and she's also going to be in the upcoming Ready Player One movie that's coming out this coming weekend. I know her best from a movie called Me and Earl and the Dying Girl, which was which was pretty good. I, I think the the guy who played Earl and the woman who played the Dying Girl, Olivia Cook, were great in the film. The guy who played the me was a little bit of a problem, but I'm not going to delve into that yet. But either way, Olivia Cook definitely did stand out in Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. And she is a woman who is struggling in high school, and she gets tutoring help from a well-off girl by the name of Lily, who's played by Anya Taylor-Johnson. And Anya Taylor-Johnson should be known to you all from the movie The Witch, which I regard as one of the best films of 2015, certainly one of the most original horror films. And she was also in the movie Split as the main protagonist, Casey Cook, who's, who was kidnapped by James McAvoy's 23 personalities. So the two of them are in this film, and it turns out that Lily has issues with her stepfather, Mark, who's played in this movie with a very quiet intensity by Paul Sparks. It's alleged or it's implied that Mark is at least emotionally abusive to Lily, but certainly emotionally and physically abusive to Lily's mother, Karen, who's played by Kaylee Vernoff. So Lily and Amanda conspire to kill Mark without making it look like they did it or they conspired to do it. So they enlist the help of one particular lowlife who lives in their suburban Connecticut area, whose name is Tim, who's played in his very last performance by Anton Yelchin. And An Anton Yelchin unfortunately died last year at the age of 27, God rest his soul. But fortunately he has a number of really good performances, not just in the three Star Trek movies, for which we can remember him. And I think for a final performance... This performance by Anton Yelchin is pretty good. And the way these murder mysteries go, there are some twists and turns. But not only that, what makes this movie really work is not only the dark subject matter, but the compelling characters, particularly those played by Olivia Cook and Anya Taylor-John. And Olivia Cook's character, Amanda, is what you would probably call sociopathic. She, she's not obsessed with murder or anything, and... But she, ha she is unable to display emotions of any kind. She doesn't feel joy. She doesn't feel sadness. And that particularly comes into play in the screenplay. And so Amanda, particularly because she's struggling a lot more in high school and doesn't have any particular ambitions after high school, has a lot less to lose than Lily does. So... I, th I think that Anya Taylor-Johnson is very much like Bella Thorne, not only strikingly beautiful, but she gets better and better every film she's in. And you certainly are probably wrestling with a lot of the emotions that Anya Taylor-Johnson's character feels more than 
Olivia Cook's character feels. And there are various twists and turns. There are some very shocking moments. It is very unpredictable. And also, even though most of the movie is deadpan, there are also some surprisingly funny moments. This movie is a little bit like Heather's, in a sense, but Heather's was a little bit more satirical and a little bit more flagrantly funny than Thoroughbreds is. Thoroughbreds is a movie where you feel a lot of the tension brimming beneath the surface, and you watch these, especially these two actresses, and the emotions that particularly Anna Taylor Johnson's character are going through is almost like watching a shaken up soda bottle just ready to pop. Or maybe, in the case of these upper class girls, maybe a bottle of champagne that's ready to pop. But I really loved the the colors of this movie, not only the set design, but also the lighting of this film. I don't think this movie is going to get any Oscar attention, but it's certainly a film where I was actually rooting for the protagonist, even though they're about to do something really, really bad, and they're conspiring to commit a felony. Actually, their conspiracy is, in and of itself, a felony. But you're still, you still know enough about Anya Taylor Johnson's character's stepfather to know that he is a bad person, and killing him probably wouldn't be the worst thing that would happen to these these girls. Probably keeping him alive would be. And a lot of that is through a lot of implicit showing. And th there is a little bit of telling, but I think the telling in this film is appropriate. But I was struck by how intense Thoroughbreds was and how the, the comic relief comes when you very least expect it. And I enjoyed Thoroughbreds a lot, and it gets my rating of a knockout. I think that Olivia Cook and Anya Taylor-Johnson have bright futures ahead of them as actresses. They're certainly amongst the best young actresses working today. I know Anya Taylor-Johnson is going to be in something really great in the next five years. Olivia Cook probably as well, although I've... I've, I've seen Anya Taylor-Johnson in more movies than Olivia Cook, but either way, I think both of them do great with the performance they have here. They work excellently together, and a great final performance by Anton Yelchin as well. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now here is my final segment of the show, which is what's coming out next. These are the top movies, unless stated otherwise, that might be coming out in a theater near you. The big movie that's coming out this coming weekend, which is Easter weekend, and probably a big weekend for movies, is Ready Player One, which is directed by Steven Spielberg and stars quite a few not particularly unknowns, but actors that are not particularly as well known. The lead actor in this movie is Ty Sheridan, and also co-starring in this film is Olivia Cook, who I just mentioned is in the excellent film Thoroughbreds, which is in independent theaters right now. And I'm also looking up what Steven Spielberg has directed since Ready Player One, because it seems like it's been a while since he has directed a film. Actually, I'm, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot this. He directed The Post, which came out last year, uh, before, it seems like a long time maybe, but I, I guess that's because you're, you're so used to Steven Spielberg, you know, having 
directed a variety of films, but... Yeah, he directed Bridge of Spies, which came out in 2015. The BFG, which undeservedly bombed, but it came out in 2016. The Post from last year, and this year, Ready Player One. And he's actually directing a remake of West Side Story, which I would love to see how that turns out. And there is a fifth Indiana Jones movie that's coming out, but if there's anybody who is go- who should direct an Indiana Jones film, or at least any Indiana Jones film... It should be Steven Spielberg. Maybe George Lucas, but I'd go with Spielberg on this one. But Ready Player One is about a virtual reality world called the Oasis. And when the creator of that virtual reality world world dies, he releases a video in which he challenges all Oasis users to find his Easter egg, which will give the finder his fortune. So that's about all I know of the movie. A lot of you have probably seen previews of it, and it would not be any doubt to me to see Ready Player One take over for number one at the box office over Pacific Rim Uprising next weekend. So that is a movie I will see, and I will let you know exactly what I think about it when I review the movie next week. Another movie that's coming out in theaters nationwide is a movie by Tyler Perry, and this time it's a drama called Acrimony. It's the movie about a faithful wife, played by Taraji P. Henson, tired of standing by her devious husband, who is played by Lyric Bent, and is enraged when it becomes clear she has been betrayed. Probably knowing a lot of African-American movies about faithful wives wives who stand by their men, the guy cheated on him. I'm just taking a wild guess because that that happens in about 90% of movies about wives who are described as faithful, especially if the movie is directed by Tyler Perry. Because it seems like whenever Tyler Perry releases a movie that's not a Medea comedy, it's about somebody having been cheated on. Think about that. But Tyler Perry's Acrimony is a film I'm not exactly enthusiastic to see, but I will see it anyway, and I'll let you know what I think about it next week. Again, I do think that Tyler Perry does have some talent in him as a director. I'm sick and tired of seeing his Medea movies, especially Boo 2 of Medea Halloween, which absolutely sucked. But I give him a chance with thrillers or just like this, and I won't declare this movie bad unless until I see it. But another movie, again, I won't declare this movie bad until I see it, but it's not giving me a lot of hope, is the third God's Not Dead movie, which is not called God's Not Dead 3, even though it could have been, but it's called God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness. And in this movie, we see again the character of Pastor Dave, played by David A.R. White, reprising his role from the previous two movies, who responds to the unimaginable tragedy as church, located on the grounds of the local university, burned down. Now this actually seems a compelling narrative because this is something bad that's actually happening to the characters in the movie and it's not some overblown philosophical argument. Not that I'm against philosophical arguments, it's just that the first two God's Not Dead movies didn't make compelling arguments about the existence of God. But here you have somebody in a Jobian situation who is maybe questioning his faith. At least I'm thinking that might be the case. But either way, God's Not Dead of Light and Darkness is out in theaters. This is a film I will see. Whether or not I enjoy it, I will let you know. But it's coming out on Easter weekend, so I I bet this movie is going to be at least in the top five at the U.S. box office, provided that the advertising is sufficient. But in any event, that just about does it for this show, Words on Film, hosted by your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees working for the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So until next week, this is Dan Burke saying, I'll see you at the movies.